Welcome to this special Meet Victoria with Caleb Shaw press conference. Today, we're at the Victoria Emergency Management Office. Whenever there's a flood, fire, hurricane, freeze, COVID, these are the folks working hard behind the scenes to try to help us recover. Let's go meet our friends Rick and Jenna. They're going to give us a tour and let us know what all really happens when they're trying to put our city back together. Let's go meet them and find out. When you think digital marketing, think ThriveFuel. Websites, social media marketing, advertising, and much more. Thrive Fuel is professional digital marketing. Welcome to Meet Victoria, where we'll get to know the people, businesses, and heroes that make this community special. I'm Caleb Shaw, owner of Shaw Realty and your host. Now let's go meet Victoria. Hey, my friend, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited. Yes, sir. Welcome to Victoria Emergency Management. Emergency Operations Center is here. Come on in and take a look with us. Let's go do it, man. All right, guys, here we are in the Emergency Operations Center. If you're like me, you did not even know this place existed. So I'm really excited to be here. Thank you for your time. Thanks Tell me about down. this place. So, um, this place is specifically designed for one thing it's an Emergency Operations Center, it's a center for emergencies to be operated under. So what we do is bring in our policymakers, the mayor, the judge, uh, city manager. We bring in all the different uh, chiefs and, and uh, command component of the different areas, ver various agencies that are here, uh, sheriff's office, uh, EMS, uh, fire department. They all come here and we develop the objectives to get us through the incident that we're in, whether it's flooding, whether it's um, a hurricane, whether it may be a, a winter storm that's coming through. All of that tactical operations happens here. Tell us where you're going. Tell us where you've been. Tell us what you're going to be doing the next operational period. How do we convey that message to all those functioning bodies that are out there, whether it's public works, whether it's public health? doesn't matter what the incident is. That's where this happens. So we have rooms that are, that are designed specifically for those job functions and those tactical operations to take place in. Go in, make the think tank happen, make sure that it actually occurs, and then those things can happen, op operate within this emergency operations center itself. Uh, during COVID, for a primary example, we have this thing broken down into several different pieces. And out here on the main operations floor, where's where all the call takers, because you gotta remember the very beginning of COVID, we had hotlines that were set up that we had hundreds and hundreds of calls every day that people wanted and they were thriving for information um, because the information was changing so dramatically. And then we went into the, to the actual testing clinics. We went to the vaccine clinics. All that registration was happening here. Uh, during hurricanes, we're in here trying to figure out, you know, how are we going to set up an evacuation center? What about our safe rooms? Uh, where are we going to do with uh, uh, pets that are going to be, uh, need to be moved inland? Uh, how do we deal with the uh, nursing homes and moving those in the hospitals? All those things are taking place within the center. We've got four different breakout spaces so we can have the tactical operations folks go in there, develop your plan, work through the little different nuances that are, are going to create problems, identify that you have the resources uh, to accomplish those goals, and then come back out, give that plan to us. Uh, the command staff can check off on that plan. The policymakers can say, yes, this is what we think we should be doing right now, and then we move forward in an operational period. That's what this whole center is designed to do, to be a resource hub of not only information, but a resource hub for resources to be engaged in the next operational period. That's so. And you guys even have an alternate 911 dispatch center here that you can use as well. Yeah, good catch. And so uh, earlier on the tour, I even showed you that. And so, yes, we have a, a backup 911 center. And so we recognize that we want to build those redundancies into place. We have an amateur radio center as well. And so what we want to do is we want to provide a location for them in case our 911 centers happen to have uh, the need for them to leave their locations. They can come here. They can still operate uh, via their radio system. They can then take the 911 calls. Um, and this regional operations center, uh, or the regional backup, is a, is a regional center as well. So folks in uh, Calhoun County, Jackson County, DeWitt County can come here and operate out of here as well. And uh, they can take their 911 calls from here and actually st still stay up and running. All right. Thanks so much for the tour. Guys, we've still got a ton to see. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And we'll put together to go bag and see if you've got everything you need to be prepared.
Welcome to Furniture Warehouse Direct. I've got lots of furniture that we've just set back out. If you're needing something right away, come into the store, check it out. You can take right off the floor. We have Simmons Beautyrest, Simmons Hybrid, and we have Simmons Beautyrest Black. Our selection of bedroom sets right now, solid wood. We have some with self-closing drawers. We still carry a little bit of everything. We're budget friendly for every budget. We have financing options. We have leasing options. Check us out at FurnitureWarehouseDirect.com and we're at 2110 John Stockbauer in Victoria, Texas. All right, guys, welcome back. Man, we knocked out that tour, learned a lot about this building, the way everything kind of starts to flow together. The one thing you're going to hear me harp through this whole entire episode is preparedness. Why it's so crucial to be prepared. Well, even though their job is rescue and emergency coordination, all of that kind of stuff, self-reliability, self-accountability is still the most important thing out there and being prepared and having a plan that you can put into action. Um, so one of the things you will hear a lot of is go bags or, you know, bug out bags, bug in bag, a safety bag, a prepared bag, a hurricane bag, whatever you want to call it, to give it a name, call it that. But get you one. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to go through. This is her bag. And by no means is this an all-inclusive list. We've grabbed a few of the big items that we're going to go through to kind of talk about their importance and, and why they matter. But don't think that if you get just what's on this table, you're set because you're not. This is a rabbit hole of preparedness that you can just start going down and, and getting there. So on that note, I like to talk so much. I can just keep going. But talk to me about the importance of having a, a go bag or a bug in bag or just a, a preparedness bag. Sure. Uh, the, I think the, the most primary importance of it is just to have that personal preparedness and that personal initiative to have the things you need when an emergency takes place or even some kind of unforeseen circumstance to where you may have a need for some life saving or life essential things. Um, that would be essentially in your go bag. Um, anywhere from hurricanes to winter storms to just anything that would, I guess, give you the, the need to be able to pick up and go in a very quick fashion. And a lot of these items transfer across different types of emergency. They're a foundation, if you will, of uh, despite the emergency, they provide a, a entry level uh, coverage and protection, so to speak, you know, like a first aid kit, for example. Absolutely. You may not know the medical emergency that you have coming, but this gives you, a, a, you know, some preparedness towards handling such. And so let's talk about that a little bit. You know, first aid kits, I know they come in. A lot of people get, if you go to Amazon, you're going to see 6,000 different emergency first aid kits. What are some common things when, you know, I know you've got this one here with all these different items. What do you, some basic kind of go to, how do they spot the difference between a $6 first aid kit and a, and a $31 or a $50 one and the importance of, of picking a good first aid kit? Sure. And I know that, like you said, there is just a vast amount of different things that you can purchase on Amazon or at your local store, what have you. I always say all, all Band-Aids work the same. Um, tourniquets work the same as well if you had some kind of event where that is necessary. Um, anything that you put into your first aid kit that is first aid related it's going to work. It's going to do its job. And it's more so of just having that on hand whenever you need it. And in those extenuating circumstances to where something may happen, you know, you're out, you know, outdoors doing something and somebody gets a really bad cut. That's where that first aid kit is going to come into play. Or maybe say you're in the middle of a, a tropical storm or a hurricane or something like that, a winter storm, if you will. Somebody gets a cut and there's, you know, really bad weather and you don't know you know, if you can make it to one of the, you know, standalone ERs or if you can make it to the hospital or to your doctor's office and you really need something that's going to help to take care of something right then and there, that's where you're going to take that personal initiative and either put together a first aid kit, buy one, and just kind of make sure it's something that works for you. Um, another thing that a lot of people take for granted is that they have their medications that they take on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. um, you know, allergy medications, uh, blood pressure medications, you name it, something that you would need on a regular daily basis, if not multiple times a day, is having extra on hand. Because of course, we've seen through tropical systems and hurricanes is those pharmacies may not always be open and they may take a little bit to come back online, given the circumstance, mm -hmm. is making sure you have those in your first aid kit as well. If you're, you know, your kids or your family members have anything that they need as well, is making sure to have that in your first aid kit, as well as your pets. I know pets can have allergies, pets can have, you know, medications that they have to take as well, is have that on hand because you don't want to be without it when something happens. And I'm just going to say it. If you've got an animal and you choose to evacuate, at least untie your animal if you're going to leave them untied. I'm not saying 
cut them loose to the deal, but if you're going, going to abandon an animal, at least give them a fighting chance. Don't leave them tied to something where later we have to come and pull a drowned animal rescue because you chose not to at least give them a fighting chance. Take care of your animals. Go through some of these items quickly for me. Some of the things like this right here is a, why in the heck would you have a can opener in here? Why, just sure. talk to me here. Uh, having a manual can opener is something that you'll see regularly on preparedness checklist for a go bag or what have you is because of course those non-perishable foods that you can stock to sustain your, you or your family or your household are going to need a something that may not require power at the time of course if, if electricity is not functioning at the time you'll need something that is just hand crank um, and so always having that because you never know what kind of circumstance you're going to be in where you may need a can opener um, and it, it could serve a lot of different functions I know I'll defer to my uh, resident Boy Scout leader that is in our office that would know there are a lot of different things that you can do with a can opener that isn't just opening cans of green beans. Yeah. Um, and, and all the more reason why learning, you know, taking it a step beyond just owning some of these items, but, but learning the multiple uses of them to help prepare, you know, people give the Boy Scouts a hard time, but man, those Eagle Scouts... You drop them in the woods, they're going to be okay. You know, we, and we'll be like, uh, anybody know an Eagle Scout we can call? <laughs> so I'm, I'm with you. And that kind of leads into some of the other items, you know, like a, an emergency radio or, or battery backups. And, and that's, that's often what catches people is all of a sudden, snap, the power's gone. Crap, my phone's not charged. My flashlight, let me go grab my flashlight out of the drawer. Uh, it's dead. Where are the batteries? I don't know. You're trying to find them in the dark and the stress level's rising and all of that. Food and hydration, I know, are two things, especially down in South Texas where it's hot. You know, we, we have a hurricane one minute, and then the next minute it's 105 degrees outside and, and 6 million mosquitoes, you know, surrounding you and all that. Um, things like bug spray, water supply, you know, things like that all come into play. And, I, I again, I know we couldn't fit everything into this one bag that we're trying to get, but... Talk to me some more of those type of items. You know, you mentioned medication already, but, you know, phone charger. What are some of the extra things they can do to help you prepare? Sure. Uh, a, I, I always use the coin term of a MOFI or a um, external battery pack that you mm -hmm. can use to charge phones, that you can use to charge a tablet if you're, you know, your kids use it or you use it or you're using it to, you know, see what's going on with the news or what have you. Um, and making sure that you have that already charged because of course like we were saying is if there's no electricity available to you you're going to need something to charge you. what we are all very reliant on is our cell phones mm -hmm. um, another thing would be extra batteries if you have your NOAA weather radio it was probably going to work off of batteries as well is just having batteries to make sure that you have them as a spare for if you need them mm -hmm. later on um, and then of course hand sanitizer because germs are everywhere, mm -hmm. uh, masks if you need them, um, and then of course, you know, sustainment for MREs and things and, like and that. And this is something I want to talk about as well, is because, you know, these things are packed, these, these MREs, that's mill ready eat for those that don't know, they're, they're styled after military uh, mills, and, and they're, they're, they're calorie dense a lot of times, where they're stacked Married. with calories because they're, in their mind, you're going to be expending a lot of calories because you're eating an MRE, so you're not at the chow hall, you're not at, you know, right. something like that. But I want to also stress that be prepared before you get down to the MRE. That <laughs> while these things are packed, and, and some of them, in the military people know what I'm talking about, sometimes you're gonna fight over the good stuff in here, maybe some of the desserts, but you really don't want to get to where you're surviving and eating solely off of MREs. And this is where that preparedness comes in of, of having a, a one month to a three month local food supply, you know, non-perishable type items that you can have and, and these are really a desperation type thing. Last thing, I'll set you up for that is talk to me about the importance of having a safety and an emergency plan and kind of A, how you put that together and B, how you execute it and, and make sure that the family is all on board. Sure. Uh, the first thing that I'll say is if you fail to plan, you will plan to fail. Um, and I know that's pretty general, but if you don't have a emergency plan for your family, for yourself, your business, your organization, Anybody, anything that you're involved in, you should have a plan for it because, of course, you have to have contingencies in place to either keep your business up and going, keep your family safe, make sure your home is safe as well. And then, of course, that sustainment is have a plan. If you're not sure what to do with creating a plan, we always recommend either ready.gov, which is FEMA's initiative, uh, and their website to where you can actually see lists of plans, whether it's a business, nonprofit organization, individual, family, for your pets. Um, if you are, if you have any kind of access or functional needs, they have all of those things on there. And then also we have our own hurricane 
preparedness guide, which is virtual this year because of COVID, um, it is at www.vctx.org slash hurricane. And that is completely available for anybody who is looking to create a plan for themselves or their family. And it just gives you all of those things that you may not think of whenever you're creating your own plan is how, what can I put in my go bag? Uh, what, what should I have at home? Um, some other things that I don't have here with this go bag it's necessarily is uh, keeping your documents, your financial documents, your house documents, things that you may need if for some reason your house is inaccessible after a disaster or an emergency or an event of some sort that you have those documents on hand and you have them readily available when you go and start to pick up the pieces of what's happening. Mm -hmm. And um, that is something that is very relevant to that emergency preparedness plan because, like I said, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail, and you don't want to be in that situation. So in any way, shape, or form that you as an individual or a family can create some semblance of a plan, even if it's just writing it down on a, a notebook of some sort, having it with you in your go bag to know if we get separated, where can we, where is our rally point? Is it going to be at this particular location? Is it going to be at grandma's house? Is it going to be three hours from here? We're just all going to know to be there in this amount of time. Um, think of those things, work through those different problems of what if. If I wanted a car and say, hey, I kind of got this, can I swing by for five minutes and show y'all what I came with and have you poke holes in it, send me, or I want to bring my whole office up here and sit down and, and go through a preparedness course with you guys. Could, could we call you all and put something together and have Absolutely. you guys kind of sharpen our knife and, and get us ready for the world? Absolutely. That's what we're here for. We're, we are here to coordinate and help individuals better propel themselves into preparedness and resilience. And I say it all the time is we are only as resilient as the individuals that we serve in a public safety capacity. So if we can help others to become more resilient and prepared on an individual level, it only helps us that much more from an emergency management response recovery standpoint. Outstanding. Outstanding. Well, guys, we will, we're going to take a break. We're going to go sit down and do our interview and learn a little bit more. But again, I want to stress, I mean, all over YouTube, all over the, the, the web, you can find all sorts of different survival type things, you know, bug out type bags, all this different information to really help you sharpen your skills, sharpen your inventory, uh, sharpen the things that you need to become an asset during uh, a, a tragedy instead of becoming a liability, you know. And so uh, thank you so much. Of I course. learned a ton. And uh, let's go sit down and talk about it. We'll okay. be right back. Tired of dirty, smelly, pest-ridden trash cans and dumpsters? At Third Coast Sanitation, we know how to fix the problem. Our hot water system reaches over 200 degrees to kill bacteria and germs. It's great for families who want to ensure a clean living environment while keeping smells at bay and detracting environment from your home. Our truck comes equipped with the water and solution and empties all dirty remnants into the dump tank we take with us. We are a fully insured and educated team excited to bring our services to the community we were raised in and are proud to call the Crossroads area home. All right, guys, welcome back, and what a day it's been. I feel like I've learned a ton today. I've gotten to tour an office that I didn't really even know existed or where they were, um, and I got to learn all that and, and, and kind of see, you know, the, the magic behind the curtain, so to speak, of where a lot of this coordination and, and stuff happens. We've also got to pack a go bag. Um, I really hope you guys got something out of that. I, I cannot stress how important self-accountability is, um, being prepared, because you always say you are, but it's a good thing to hear. So... Now that we've already hit all those, I'd like to sit down and talk to the people that actually pull the strings behind here and keep things running and keep things moving forward. So without further ado, my friends, if you would, please introduce yourselves. Uh, thank you for having us. Rick yes. Cabrera, Emergency Management Coordinator for Victoria Office of Emergency Management. My name is Jenna West. I'm the Deputy Emergency Management Coordinator for Victoria City County. Roger that. How long have you guys been doing this? Uh, I've been here since 2007, so about 15 years. And okay. you pretty much named the disaster, have probably been through it. <laughs> Fun so, stuff. And I've been, <clears throat> been here going on about six years. I started in uh, the public health emergency preparedness position and have moved over to my deputy position as of now, but, but just about six years. Gotcha. So for somebody like me that, that walking in here really just had no clue about you guys, sure. and that's not a knock against you all. I should be better prepared. I should know these things, and I'm, I'm trying to play catch up now and learn them, but what the heck is OEM and what is you all's role in the community? Sure. So Office of Emergency Management, uh, we usually just go by Victoria Emergency Management. Our main primary role is coordination. It's taking the first responding bodies that are out there, fire, police, EMS, public works, public health, and bringing all those folks into one location at one time and make sure the job gets done. Uh, look at the objectives that we have set out, 
make sure that we have the tactical operations to make those objectives and achieve those, uh, identify any resource shortfalls we may have, whether it be personnel, whether it be resources themselves, and then move that downstream into the next operational period to get the job done. And hopefully it gets back to square one or uh, home of the state as soon as we can. Get us back to where we were at in the very beginning. Uh, whether it's a flood, whether it's a fire, whether it's a hurricane, uh, but bringing all those bodies together and coordinating those things. Uh, oftentimes we say, you know, the firefighters don't need to know what the cops are doing. The cops don't need to know what the firefighters are necessarily doing. Go out and do your individual jobs. Let us paint that picture, that total overall coordination piece. Let us paint that so everybody has an understanding. And then ultimately, uh, then we take that and move it to the state level for any type of uh, regional or state resources we may need, all the way up to the federal level and making sure that we have those, that support there. So that, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. So, vert, you know, say the state, since you just said the state, you know, and, and to keep from them having to pick up the phone and call the police department, the, the sheriff's office sure. here, uh, the EMT, you know, whoever, it, they can call you guys. And then you guys can kind of be the liaison that helps coordinate and, and centralize, so to speak, all Very the information so. coming in and then help disperse it out in a, in a better fashion. Absolutely. Good. Yeah. And that that we'll use, you know, since since Hurricane Ida has just been in the news and stuff, let, let's let's use hurricanes. I know we got hit with Harvey a few years back and that was a big deal. Is that something where you guys were in full effect behind the scenes? And if so, kind of from 30,000 feet, kind of walk me through that a little bit. I don't need, you know, the the whole, well, at 203 we went here. But, <laughs> but you know, like, it's kind of a we have looking back. Today. Yeah, I, I, I so believe you. That's why I wanted to make sure. I don't need the, the time stamps. But, you know, kind of an umbrella. What happened? And what did this office, if, just an overview summary of what you all did during Hurricane Harvey? Sure. Uh, around from the in, the inception of knowing that there was possibly a tropical depression or a tropical system of some sort, that's where, like I said, our, our, our antennas start to go up and we start to really take a deep look at the information that we're being provided from the National Hurricane Center, the National Weather Service, you name it, and really start to see what is it that they are forecasting. And then from there, we're providing that situational awareness information to city and county leadership, our different chiefs in our different departments, and then even our external partners in the community. And from there, as it started to evolve, of course, we're seeing that it's more than likely going to become a hazard or a threat to us here on the Middle Texas coast. And that is where we start to kind of assemble our forces, for lack of better terms. Uh, we activate our EOC, our Emergency Operations Center, which is where we're at now. And it's really just a conglomerate effort between city and county uh, staff and leadership making decisions based on the things that need to happen here locally in our jurisdiction and then of course coordinating between the state of Texas and the Texas Division of Emergency Management to the National Hurricane Center, the National Weather Service and it's really just a back and forth um, providing the information from the subject matter experts either from a meteorology perspective from a fire and EMS perspective, we're just sharing that information and coordinating, like Rick was uh, alluding to earlier, is being that one body in between all of these different agencies, because of course it can just be an alphabet soup of information <clears throat> if you don't have one conglomerate effort and everybody's pulling the wagon in the same direction. And that's kind of what emergency management did during Hurricane Harvey. And it really is that first initiative of life safety then everything else falls in between is just making sure that people are safe. And of course, the best way that we can do that is to communicate effectively between agencies and what have you. And of course, trying to get to that new sense of normal, because of course, after <clears throat> an event like that happens, is it's a new sense of normal for everybody. Sure. And, and along the new sense of normal is one of the things where you hear that a lot now is COVID, you know, and, and <clears throat> one of the things that I thought that the city, county, et cetera, did well was was information after, you know, once we started kind of seeing things. And, and at first I understood nobody knew what was going on. And it was kind of, you know, the blind leading the blind to a degree because sure. we were all trying to figure this out at the same time. Were you all involved in in say those press conferences, stuff like that. Was that as well, you all coordinating with everybody during that as well? Yes, yeah. uh, uh, the press conferences are actually held here in our emergency operations center. And more so because just like Hurricane Harvey, that was a combined effort between all of the different agencies and departments that were involved in the COVID-19 response and still are. Uh, so we're regularly communicating with each other even now to make sure that the information as we're being provided, that information from the CDC or whoever, the Department of State Health Services, that we are making sure to get that information to each other in a timely fashion, like those press briefings and the different so social media pushes and talking to the media outlets and things like that, just making and, sure that it's all timely. And we're often 
the people that actually provide the tool basket, toolbox, you know, we're the ones that actually provide all that and then make sure that all those coordinating bodies actually start putting their tools inside of it. And so as Jenna alluded to, we have the, the press conferences here, so we have the technology that's already set up. We have public information officer classes that we put on here so we can bring in the newly elected officials, uh, chiefs of various departments, uh, personnel from the various departments, so they can learn how to talk in front of a camera, so uh, know what a press brief is going to be like. And, and we've actually had our local media come in here, film folks while we're doing those classes, bring it back out here, and, and as a class we critique those. And so we always provide all of those tools to go inside that toolbox so that way people can get the job done in a more efficient, effective manner. Well, that's spectacular. And I know from a community standpoint, it's something that, that was appreciated because I, you know, I would watch those, those numbers rise quickly as people started sure. view, tuning into those <clears throat> live events. And it, it showed that there was a thirst for that knowledge. And I was grateful that you guys were putting that out and, and, and making it available to us. What are, I'm guessing you guys have probably learned some lessons over doing this. And you know, I would guess, you know, I know we had in the military, we had debriefings after we sure. did stuff. Do you guys go back once there is an event or something happens? <laughs> do you all go back and, okay, what could we have done different? What could we learn yeah, from here? Absolutely. It doesn't matter what scale of the, of the event that it is or an incident. It could be a large scale one like Hurricane Harvey to, to COVID all the way down to a very small scale event that we had just uh, last week or two ago when we had um, the 42 or 40 ish uh, immigrants that were inside of the U Haul coming up from Warfrio. Even though it wasn't ours, we sat down with our hospitals, we sat down with the responding agencies, say, what do we do right? Check, let's keep doing it. What do we do wrong? What are things that we need to improve upon? Uh, and obviously the first one we always hear on every incident we ever go through, whatever event it is, whether it's Boot Fest, Fourth of July, doesn't matter, uh, it's communications. Mm -hmm. uh, we see that in our day in our lives with our, our spouses, with our loved ones. The first thing we find out that it fails in almost everything we do is communications. How do I get the information in a more efficient, effective manner and the right information? Uh, and we see that all the time. No, I, I, I couldn't agree more, and I agree with you. That's pretty much across the board. If you could sure. just continuously work on communication, you'll always be improving. Sure. And I, I think that's a spectacular point. Now, when you do talk about the community, I will say that I think the community drops a ball in a lot of areas. I'm not f finger pointing, but <laughs> self-accountability, reliability, you know, realizing that <clears throat> while you guys are good at what you do, your primary job is not yeah. to come save me because I chose not to prepare for a hurricane or prepare for a freeze. And, and I understand that some people may not have the knowledge and, and all of that, but as a community, what is something that, that you see, you know, how important is it that we are prepared and able, because I would guess that when you guys have to come rescue us or you have to stop what you're doing to coordinate, you know, food, you know, food disbursement, things like that. Um, I would take that, that our challenge that that takes, you know, your resources, your manpower and all this to, take care of people that I would argue should have been taking care of themselves. And I know there are always some that can't. And that for one reason or another, they're not physically able to or are fiscally able to. And so those aren't the people that I'm addressing. But I'm, I'm talking about the, the person sitting at home, laying on the couch with a bag of Cheetos, you know, ignoring all the warnings to be prepared for a hurricane sure, sure. or something. Ah, I'm good. I'm good. Well, you're not good. Um, and I would, you know, after Harvey to see the food lines, the second day people lined up to get food and stuff. What is something you would say to the community? What, you know, again, I know we've, we've packed the go bag and we've learned that stuff, but to just hammer that point again, what would you say to the community to preach the importance of being prepared? The most concise way that I could think to tell a community, mem a community member how they could best prepare themselves, their family, whoever, is do not let complacency set in. Exactly. And I, I use that analogy because I've heard it multiple times in the short time that I've been in emergency management is, oh, well, I wrote out X hurricane or tropical storm, or I did this, so therefore I'm not going to do this in the future because I was safe then. And something that we know all too well is no two systems or tropical systems are alike, no matter whether they have the same attributes or not. No two will have the same impacts. Even down to any other threats or hazards is we saw it this year with the uh, winter storm Uri is none of us have really taken that oh, on of, of having a, a winter storm impact us the way that it did make sure that that complacency isn't setting in and think of I almost try and conceptualize it as like the, the question that you were asked as a little kid if you were to be on a deserted island by yourself what would you take with you and I mean of course don't give it an, a, a finite number but what would you take with you to survive what would you take with you to make sure that you were comfortable 
there'd be a lot of things on that list. Sure. And of course, besides just those basic human necessities of food, water, and shelter, there are a lot of things that you'd have to take into account from medications that, you know, seeing those things in a go bag, um, from financial documents to an extra charger for your phone, things to keep your children occupied. If you have pets, making sure that your pets are accounted and taken care of. Um, you name it, and I know we were talking about that earlier going back and forth, is that there are a lot of things on that list, and there, you know, it, it never ends to where you think of, how can I best prepare myself for this? Um, but that complacency, don't ever let that set in, because the second that you do, that, that renders you unprepared in a sense, because you never know what's going to happen next. I want to add on to the complacency comment she made. You know, we oftentimes look at what's happened to us in the past, and if it hasn't happened to you or I, Therefore, we don't think it ever it occurred. And so it's like getting in the batter's box. Why do I have to wear this helmet? Why do I have to wear this protective gear? I won't get hit until the moment you get hit. Then mm -hmm. all of a sudden you realize how important that equipment is. And we saw that with Hurricane Harvey. The complacency starts to set in. 1961 was the last major hurricane we had come through our area, Hurricane Carla. And since then, we had a few other small hurricanes. 2003 was Hurricane Claudette. Strengthened in Category 1, created a lot of damage around here. Seven to ten days without power. 100,000 cubic yards of debris. But then Category 4 Hurricane Harvey comes along in Rockport. And one of the things we have to t contend with now is when we go out and talk to public groups all the time is they say, well, I lived through a Category 4 hurricane here in Victoria. No, you didn't. You prepared for a Category 4 hurricane because we knew it was coming to our direction. We knew it was coming inland and we it was going to go over Rockport and start heading this way. But when the winds actually finally got to us, only a small section of our community had Category 2 hurricanes. And I'm saying a small section, mm -hmm. western side of our county did. There were some pocketed areas that had some downburst winds, some, some areas that had some tornadic activity um, that increased those wind speeds. But in all reality, most of, most of Victoria blew through a Cat 1 hurricane, the same as Hurricane Claudette was when it came through in 2003. So the complacency that gets set in and, and the misinformation is, well, I prepared for this Category 4 and I wrote out this Category 4, so I'll be okay, is exactly what we don't want to hear. Um, it's kind of like having that spare tire and never learning how to use it. You alluded to that earlier about the person sitting on their, their couch eating their Cheetos and stuff. If they haven't learned how to put on the spare tire, which is why dads go out and show their daughters or their sons on how to put on the spare tire, because we don't want them trapped on the side of the road. Mm -hmm. That complacency cannot be in our mind because we can't think of ourselves, hey, since this has happened to me, it won't happen. Because mm -hmm. in tropical regions and in incidents themselves, whether it's flooding, whether it's extreme heat, whether it's heat exhaustion, it doesn't matter what it is. It could occur to you, and the likelihood is, is high. And we need to make sure that we're prepared for those things and we're ready to respond. Because the biggest thing is when that complacency sets in, the less resilient we become as a society. And when the less resilient we are become, more that we have to do to help save somebody else or provide those components to them. We're only as, at, we, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Sure, We're no. only as resilient as the individuals that we serve Absolutely. in public safety. So if individuals are unprepared or they don't have a semblance of a plan when it comes to preparedness for either hurricane season, flooding, they don't have homeowner's insurance or something that's helping to mitigate the impact of what's happening during a natural or man-made cause event or hazard. It makes us it's less effect, resilient. Yeah. It's a, yeah, it's a toppling, toppling effect, effect or what have you. Well, I completely agree with that. And, and that, that's a perfect segue into the, my final set of questions is, is you guys don't just tell us to be prepared. You also have additional classes that we can call Absolutely. and we can get with you guys to help that. And I'll use the, the Stop the Bleed course, for example. You know, I know my, myself and a lot of my buddies, you know, we're rocking these first aid kits on our belts or in our trucks and all this. Well, I haven't taken a, a first aid, self-aid buddy care class since the military, which has probably been, you know, shoot, I don't want to do math in public, roughly about 20 years, you know. Um, and if nothing in there is the same anymore. So, you know, I'm guilty of having this fancy, expensive first aid kit that I don't know what two-thirds of the stuff in there sure. do. Sure. So I know we are getting with Ralph and we're scheduling a, one of you all stop the bleed course so we can actually go through these things and learn. Can you briefly tell me about some of the courses like to stop the bleed or some of the just say I'm, I'm curious about how I can be better and prepare my business, my coworkers, my community, my neighborhood. Um, what are some of the things that you guys offer to help with those things, education. Sure, uh, you did already mention the uh, Stop the Bleed course. We we'll also can host uh, Hands Only CPR, which is another fantastic course to take. Um, I know a lot of our uh, facilities in our, in our trauma service area also provide that training as well. Um, however, it is invaluable because something that we say as people that are in the response field is parents or whoever in the community they are our initial first responders so if you Absolutely. you know mm -hmm. if you see your son fall off of his bicycle when he's learning how to ride the bike you're the first person, you're the first person that's that's responding until we can have 
other people to help. And um, not only handling CPR, stop the bleed, but we have incident command courses. If there's somebody who you know aspires to be a volunteer with our community emergency response team, I know Ralph's really trying to kick that back up and make it to where those individuals that are engaged with CERT can assist our responding agencies from the fire department, police department, the sheriff's office, you name it, with a multitude of different things, events, you know, unforeseen yep. circumstances. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, just depends on what it is that they're looking for, but uh, a lot of our courses are either from TEKS, which is at the Texas A&M system, or it is also through the Department of Homeland Security, through FEMA, you name it, we have some courses, and if there's something that somebody out there wants to take that is in the emergency management FEMA realm, realm. by all means, contact our office and we can work on trying to get it scheduled. And we do that all the way down from the Stop the Bleed to, to the hands-only CPR, as Jenna was saying, all the way down to our practitioners that are in here with us, um, to the auditor's office or the finance team at the city of Victoria. We bring in finance classes for them. Um, so that way we're not in the throes of it when they're trying to muddle through it and trying to fix mm -hmm. it right then and there or trying to, to learn those um, those traits that they need to have. Because once again, it's our job is to bring all those coordinating bodies together to develop that picture, to hand off to the judge and the mayor, to say, are we doing the things you expect out of us? What are the directions we need to go? Um, and then here are the tools that we need to, to make it happen. And if we talk a similar language, if we have a new public works person comes in, to a public works person that may be working down in one of the water districts or maybe down in Bloomington, if we bring them into this environment, we give them those tools and we train them in a certain way, and our communities around us are doing the same thing, which falls under this whole neat umbrella that's called NIMS, National Incident Management System, um, if all of us are talking that same language, her and I can leave here and go to Corpus Christi and support them. We can leave here and now go to Louisiana and support them mm -hmm. with a response because those folks are going to get burned out. And so they're going to need the capability to go ahead and understand that, hey, we got other people that can come in. The Calvary can come in and help us so we can go home and get some rest, go take care of our own mm -hmm. families and things like that. And so we provide a lot of those tools in here. And uh, on an air, average year, we probably estimate anywhere about six to 9,000 training hours of all the people. This Friday we'll be at the Victoria Police Academy uh, teaching over there. And so just a, a variety of things happen here. Wow. So, so for people that are, are interested or maybe they want to get in contact with you all, can they just call the office and, and or shoot you a message to your Facebook page, things like that? Is that a good way to reach you sure, all? Sure, sure. Good deal. Well, guys, thank you so much. I had a ton of fun. I, I learned a lot. I, I walked in here completely ignorant to how a lot of this work and, and it was really humbling, and, and it's, it's neat to see the hard work that goes on behind the scenes. And for that, I, I thank you. You know, everybody's very quick to throw rocks and, and point fingers and, and all of that, but not everybody comes around and says thank you. And so I, I do want to say very sincerely, thank you for the hard work you guys do in the community. It's felt. It's noticed. Um, and we're grateful for it. And so thank you. Guys, thanks so much for tuning in. We really are grateful. Thank you for everybody that helps in an emergency situation and everybody that gives back to, to better the community. But on that note, self-reliance. It, mm -hmm. it is not, you are not to be dependent on the government. You are supposed to be independent of the government and take care of your own to the best of your ability. But thankfully, when you need help the most, we have great folks out there willing to step up and put it all out there on the line to help you. Guys, thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you at the next one. Thanks so much for tuning in to Meet Victoria with Caleb Shaw. If you haven't done so already, make sure you comment below, share the videos. It really helps the algorithms. Also, make sure you like the page, follow the page. And if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of our videos. Also, if you want to be featured on Meet Victoria, shoot us a message. We'd love to hear from you. And finally, make sure you support our great sponsors. We could not do this without them, and we're grateful and blessed to have them. Thanks so much for tuning in, and we will see you at the next one.